We're glad to know you're still there and watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Uh, right now, we're going to lift from off the press uh, headlines that made it to the national dailies. And uh, to do that with us and help us make sense uh, with some of the headlines, we have a public affairs analyst talking to us from Akwaibom uh, in the person of architect Ezekiel Nyaitok. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning and thanks for having me as always. God bless you. You too. Okay, uh, we're beginning this morning with uh, Daily Independence. Today we have just uh, three papers that we're going to cover. And let's just take some of the headlines here before we begin to dissect them one after the other. In Daily Independence, the boldest headline is Further Naira Devaluation Seen. Now exchanges for 917 Naira per dollar. And the rider on that story is federal government may be forced to review FX liberalization policy. And that's according to analysts. We also have on top of that uh, front page, Niger coup, NGE calls for strategic engagement and diplomacy. Then um, we have uh, a health issue, breastfeeding lowers risk of breast ovarian cancers. Then other smaller headlines have um, Supreme Islamic Council opposes sanctions, military actions in Niger. Um, Nigeria loses 3.46 trillion naira to poor infrastructure, others at ports. And Revs threaten to invoke powers against IPPIS AMCON budget office. MFLA asks court to stop DSS from further prosecuting him and subsidy removal a kitty case 5,000 naira monthly to 10,000 poor households and food distribution. Okay, um, those are the headlines on the front pages, on the front page rather, of the Daily Independent. And Mr. Um, architect, let's begin with naira devaluation. Naira devaluation now. Uh, there's liberalization of the currency, and we're seeing the dollar exchanging for about 917 naira. Even though in, in Lagos it's still about 800 and something, but in other places, maybe Kaduna and other centers, it's exchanging in the black market for 917 and beyond. So, this liberalization, is it hurting us or not? Because they told us that it is a good policy and it will make things better in the shortest possible time. But now it's 917 Naira. What are your thoughts? Yeah, the very first thing is that I like going foundational. Mm. What makes the currency of a country to go up in value or to go down? when you are able to establish the dynamics that make it to either appreciate or depreciate, then you are able to address those fundamentals that address it. And then you'll be able to get the desired result. Any policy that is not based on data, statistics, and um, uh, foundational, uh, you know, when they talk about first principles, all such policies cannot go far. Why is the Naira depreciating? Currency depreciates when the demand for it is more than the supply for it. How do we get about demands? Demands come from the test of the people where even toothpick is imported. Demand comes from industrialists who want to get certain components to be able to run their factories or their industries, where those components are probably available in raw material form in their country, but they export such materials in the raw form and go ahead to import them back as finished products with the added, added, added cost and losing all the derivatives that will come there from. Demand, you know, exceeds supply where the people do not produce. Then on the other hand, the currency appreciates when the supply is more than the demand. And where do the supplies come from? Number one, 
people appreciate and they you know patronize locally made goods so they don't need any foreign exchange to buy foreign goods so the demand on the call it dollar this time is not so high number two people are producing so much and are exporting they are exporting on account of which on the basis of the exports they are gaining more and more and more currency so the currencies they bring in is more than the demands here as a result that price hikes number three government is training their people in-house and not sending them abroad paying extra code paying flights and buying the flight ticket in dollars number four or five the foreign airlines are not the predominant carriers as a result they have to you know have capital repatriation their money has to go back to them but the local airlines are strong enough the national carriers to carry the people so you buy your ticket in naira and not in dollars now what is the basis of policy intervention along this very simple economics i'm an architect so if I know this one plus one to be two, then the mathematician should know the exponents and the extrapolation of figures to get better results. So for me, you know, coming to just address these matters in the media, you know, superficially, or oh, government, you know, doing the analysis, they don't make sense. Why can't Mr. President do one, two, three things? Number one, just as you did not submit list of ministers at the same time you can also sway in ministers in batches get your minister of finance sway the person in inside your office there's no ceremony to it all you need is to take the oath of office and there's nothing that defines where it must be taken get us a minister of finance get us a minister of defense get us a minister of health Get us a minister of, um, For, of uh, foreign affairs, uh, maybe. petroleum, yes, and labor. This critical problem, and of course, the attorney general and minister of justice, these five people, sway them in, let them go in and start to do their work. Today, everything is being coordinated from the office of the, of the um, uh, what was the name, uh, Bajabia Mila, his uh, office, chief of staff. Chief of staff, yeah. Not even secretary to government of the federation. There's something fundamentally wrong. And this is not the Tinubu that I've known before today. There's something, something curiously wrong. So the Naira will continue to, to just, I was very sure I could have sworn, you know, with my little finger that by today, the Naira will be hovering around $500. I was very sure of that because I believe that as soon as uh, President Tinubu came in, or President, well, I've always believed that it would be either APC or it would be Labour Party. Any of the two people, you know, Peter will be for his let's move from consumption to production, then Tinubu for his capacity to bring in a team of technocrats to handle the system. These two were the two people that I felt any of them coming in, you know, the economy will start to breathe life. And I foresaw a situation where the dollar actually went to exchange for about 300 naira eventually. But what's happening right now uh, uh, defies logic as far as my mind is concerned. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, let's hope for the best because uh, at that time when uh, the CBN had a different rate from the um, open market as it is or the black market, um, some people could breathe. Uh, there was a possibility that uh, if you don't get it from the black market, you can get it from the official rate. Uh, but now that has been abolished and they say that things will get better and it's still the way it is. Now it is uh, almost a thousand naira. And I'm sure in some, on some occasions it will get to a thousand naira uh, per dollar. And that is really, really not good for us. Okay, there are two headlines here uh, that are similar. And... Um, Nijeku, NGE calls for strategic engagement and diplomacy. And also, Supreme Islamic Council opposes sanctions, military action in Niger. Well, pronouncements have already been made that an ultimatum has been, was given and the day has passed. Now, President Tinubu is saying 
that whatever he said was not his. The presidency is saying whatever uh, it had said about uh, military might and all that was not theirs. It's, it was a, a coerced thing. And now they're coming back to talk about dialogue and all that. Is that just trying to save face? Or how, let me just say, how can we save face uh, now that it has gotten to this point? Now, Niger is daring us. Mali is daring us. Burkina Faso is daring us. And the world powers that are supporting them are daring us from the background. And we need to stay strong and we need to stay united. What other approaches can be used to save face and then restore the kind of uh, normalcy that we want to see in Niger, in your opinion, please? Yeah, you know, there's a saying, a Latin saying, if you don't understand, don't bother, I will interpret. <laughs> a Latin that, say, that says, That's As Latin. Mef. That's Latin, Wait. right? If you don't understand, just <laughs> I can teach you. Okay. Atie kufok oye mefu. As mefu oye muyong. What that simply means that when you are here, you want to go there. When you are there, you want to come back home. Mm -hmm. You see, when you are the chairman of a body, it's like you're being the president of a, 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 an, an organization, you know? They say the box stops on your table. If you are hasty in taking a decision, now we could have maybe been a little um, uh, more understanding uh, with Mr. President that probably he was compelled to take a certain decision with it without thinking through. If at home we could see him as a man who thinks through every decision before he takes he is strategic, he is analytic, he is firm. So we can say because he was the chairman of ECOVAS and they were all co-heads of state, maybe that is why they kind of prevailed upon him to pronounce something that he did not believe in. But the question is, in Nigeria, do we really see our president as one who thinks through all the issues before he takes a decision? Will we say that he thought through the issue of, you know, fuel subsidy, put things in place, and took a decision? Would we say that the monetary policy about floating the Naira, he thought through it before taking a decision, on account of which we can say, look at his track record. That's the sort of person he is. So for him to have announced this uh, military option, uh, military threat, you know, he must have been forced by others, we can understand. So for him to say that now is, um, is difficult for me to really buy that story. But bottom line, we are here, we are here. What's the way forward? Americans say, cut your losses. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, it's become clear that military option is not an option at all on the table as far as Nigeria is concerned. If you look at the details of the dynamics of the country in Niger, where our past president says, even when he leaves, you go and meet his cousins. Those people, Niger and Nigeria, and northern Nigeria, there's no line. All that closing of border, I don't understand how they close border, because if you close border, it means that the, the, the airlines cannot go there, even the road transportation cannot go there, even people cannot pass. And I kept asking, so how did Emir of um, the Kano, former Emir, Sanusi, my Oga, how did he go there? Did he, did he, how, how did he, he disappeared and reappeared there? Uh, so, so all those things. And if you know how that border is, closing it is an intellectual exercise because, I mean, how do you close what is uh, as porous is? You know, you can walk across, you can, you know, you know, there's, I don't even know what to say, but for now, I think that what Mr. President needs to do is have around him strategic thinkers who thinks three steps ahead you know there's something about government and governance that we do not have in nigeria and we so desperately need to have and that is a back room you know cabinet that is not known faceless nobody knows them but the job of these people is to take every issue and go three steps ahead Take every issue. Do you know that the phone that you have that comes out today 
was ready almost 10 years ago. Some five years ago, they kept doing testing and refining and testing and refining as we sit today. You know, I happen to have a son that is into, you know, this field of, 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 of the ICT where the like forecast, he, he tells me what will happen in the next 10 years. I'm like, wow, do you understand me? You need to know five years ahead of you, several steps ahead before it happens. Before there's a coup, you ask yourself, assuming there's a coup in Mali, assuming there's a coup in Niger, uh, whatever, assuming there's a coup in this, what are the dynamics? What will play out? If it plays out like this, what should be step one? What should be is assuming nobody's thinking of coup at all. Assuming there's this in this, they think through situations. They are strategic thinkers. They are people who are versed with options and possibilities. They are world beaters. They, they, you must, whatever it costs you to have such people, have them. So that you keep smelling like a rose and people are like, wow, this guy is always on point. He is not always on point. He has back door, back room, you know, uh, you know, dressing where they get things ready for him way ahead of time. If that happened, number one, we would have had an option, assuming there was a coup in, my, in, 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 in Niger. Option two, you see, a coup in Niger is not the same thing as a coup in Cameroon. It's not the same thing as a coup in Ghana. It's not, the dynamics are different because within the borders, there are certain relationships. And, you know, there's this francophone, anglophone kind of, um, you know, rivalry, so to speak. And we are surrounded by the francophone. The one anglophone that, uh, the one francophone that we seem to have a good relationship with is Niger. Niger leads us to uh, Li uh, Liberia. What is happening in Liberia has so much, you know, Niger as a buffer before it comes to us in Nigeria. This is so, a very strategic country. That's where we need to be very careful and not to start what we cannot finish. The best thing is for Mr. President, I, I think if I'm right, the, 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 the strategic interventions might be a strategic thinking, do you understand me, to give him a kind of fallback, you know, in that, oh, because the clergy, because the uh, professionals, because this, because that, because of the overwhelming, and I'm the president of Nigeria, as much as this is done, since I hold in trust the mandate of Nigerians, and Nigerians have overwhelmingly come to me to ask me to think about these gentlemen. I understand that this was a collective um, issue, but you see, I'm first before uh, being the chairman of ECOWAS, I am first the president of Nigeria, and if they remove that mandate, I cannot even be here. So my people said we should do it this way. Let him present it that Nigerians have overwhelmingly directed him directed him, not suggested to him. The office of the citizen is one thing that I'm, been, I've been, I'm now starting to take on as a national discourse and a national assignment and engagement. We need to understand the concept of the office of the citizen. Mr. President is our employee. He's not, he's not a monarchy. He's not a boss. He's not a king. He is elected by us, which means we have sent him. So he reports to us. We are the owners of the mandate. He is not the owner. He didn't buy us. We sent him. When you realize that, then you discover that he must, of necessity, without any uh, room for maneuver, report to the people and do what the bidding of the people is. Mm. OK, let's move to another item. Uh, a fuel subsidy. We, we, we hear that Equity State has uh, approved uh, 5,000 Naira monthly to 10,000 poor households and food distribution as well. Remember that Ekiti State has a population of over 3 million, 305, 3 million 500,000 something and above. And 10,000 households are earmarked to be given 5,000 Naira monthly uh, with food. And that's the same thing playing out at the national level, where we have over 200 million people and 8,000 is promised to citizens um, of 12 million households. So a household will get 
8,000 uh, 8, naira uh, per month, that vulnerable household might have seven people inside that household, or it might have eight people or 10 people. The poorer, the more in population anyway, we have seen from experience that we have here, because the poor have only themselves. Uh, they don't have critical meetings to attend anywhere. They don't have uh, things that will occupy them in the, in the office and all that. They have themselves, so they tend to have more children and more relations staying uh, in the same place. So 12, uh, 12 million households to get 8,000 naira each for six months, just six months. After that, you're on your own. And Equity State is talking about um, 5,000 to uh, households, 10,000 households for every month, and I'm just asking myself, where is this leading us? Fuel subsidy was supposed to save money for us, and now everybody's talking palliatives, and it seems to be just another hydra-headed monster with a different name. Or what do you think? You know, you know yeah, I, I belong to the labor civil society group at the highest level. And um, yesterday we had a meeting of probably about um, maybe less than 20 of us. Uh, you, when you have a meeting where you have the likes of the president of NLC is there, the likes of Mr. Pat Tommy is there, and um, I don't need to go calling the rest of the names. It's an extremely high-powered, you know, meeting, and I'm privileged to be part of that body. And we, 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 we just crack our heads as to where we are going as a nation. Our, our mindset, you know, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm bothered that we seem to run what I call here and now crazy. It's about here and now. It's about here and now. We don't think about tomorrow and nations are built on foundations of, you know, forecasting the future, long-term planning, strategic long-term planning. In a kitty state that you just said, I'll tell you what happens. Every month, 50 million naira goes down. To where? I don't know. Because in a population of 3 million, what is 10,000? You bring out 10,000 people out of 3 million people. You feed them for a couple of months and it ceases. After the three months, five months, six months, the question is, what have you achieved? I'll tell you two things that you've achieved. Number one, you have 10 million 50 million, 50 million every month. If you extrapolate 50 million for five months, you are talking of 250 million. Six months, you are talking of 300 million. Gone down, and you creating dependency syndrome in 10,000 people, where their case is worse off. Please don't put sugar on my mouth and remove it. Allow me to be eating my salt, using salt to drink my gari. The moment you introduce sugar for me to drink my gari, and I get used to that, and then you remove, you stop giving me that sugar. What do you think you have done to me? You've made my situation worse. It's like a man that used to go on KK, everybody knows him, he goes on his KK, you go and give that man a car, and the environment knows him now as a car owner. Six months after, you remove the car from the man. You say, ah, my guy, how far, where your motto? Where your motto? Where your motto? So he's now faced with that social stigma of a used to be, you know? But if he was going with his KK, you know, Maybe he would have now started maybe using both from time to time because he has been able to improve himself. What am I saying? The federal government is by giving 8 million naira to about, uh, sorry, 8,000 8, naira to about 12 million people in six months would have committed about 30, 35 billion. 
into voicemail and creating, like what I've just said, dependency syndrome, social stigma, and unsustainable lifestyle. But if the federal government, like I made a proposal to them, a billion, I will give you what I call an enterprise estate. Enterprise estate is, you know, local. It has 200 housing units, one bedroom. It has an enterprise center of operator. It teaches 200 young people certain skills, and it is there. 200 houses will be built by probably 200 people who will have engagement and opportunity of making some money, maybe five million, over a period of time of the construction. At the end of that six months, what do you have? You have in the very, very, very minimum, I'm talking about waiting to one state. I'm talking about Kwaibo, for instance. That's what will come to a Kwaibo. That's why I did an open letter to Mr. Pre and said, please, that 35 billion that should come to a Kwaibo state, do not give to faceless who don't know. Bring it. Let us establish enterprise estate in at the very minimum 10 of the federal constituencies in Akwaibo so that at the end of one year, we would have an estate that has been built and all the money has gone to empower the people. We have 200 young people that are trained on a regular basis. We have something to see, to hold on to. Mm -hmm. We have people who go back and become employers of labor. Mm -hmm. We have something that continues to kind of expand. It's like a ripple. The water you drop keeps expanding after this period. Now, compare A and B. Option A, that 30 something billion has gone. Voicemail is over. Do you understand me? Option B, we now have this estate in 10 federal constituencies where young people are being trained, where they are cultivating food, where they are getting productivity, where things are being. So there's a difference between consumption of 8,000 and production of enterprise estate. I mean, it's a no-brainer for you to know what makes sense. But we have this here and now crazy, where we must do what the people will see, what people will hear. And it doesn't make sense. But even the enterprise uh, thing you're talking about, people will see it. And that is a collective enjoyment as it is. Because if you, give, you. If you give to 12 million people that kind of, that kind of money, uh, at least more than half of these people will not be known, as you have called them faceless people. That's, that's the reality on ground. And the people that will even be known, maybe they'll be yeah. getting 6,000 instead of 8,000. It happens in our Thank Nigeria, you. and nobody Thank checks you. them. But, you know, you. coming to, to enjoying life as it is, uh, with the 8,000 or 5,000 as the case may be, now, uh, you are on common governor, <laughs> former governor, uh, who you like, anyway, uh, Kwabio, who is now the Senate president, said that some money had been sent to the senators. I'm reading from the, the Daily uh, Trust right now. And he said that they are going to enjoy life. The clerk of the house had sent that money to them for them to go and enjoy their holidays. And he came under fire and he had to apologize. And then after apologizing, he also said that the money that uh, Nigerians are mischievously, that's the word he used, mischievously saying that they are just sending to the Senate for them to eat or to enjoy themselves is because they need a lot of things. For instance, they need cars because they cannot do oversight functions with keke. Those were the words he used. And he also said, that they have no working tools. They went into the tent assembly and they didn't meet computers with which to work. I don't know, how does government really work? Because it surprises me that the government will leave or legislators will leave and another set will come in and start buying everything including computers. I'm surprised that legislators will have that kind of money at uh, their disposal, being paid to them, uh, by the way, and then they still vote out some other money for them to buy cars, the latest model of, uh, of Jeeps, to buy them, 2023 20, model of whatever car they're going to buy, that will cost the country 40 billion naira. What really happens in governance? What is the thing that makes 
public officers behave this way or makes us treat them the way we are treating them, you know, like demigods and all that. Is that how it should be? Or what do we need to do to change the narrative? It, 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 it's one of the things that we spent so much time last night, you know, deliberating upon. We have come to have a very wrong perspective of what government and governance is. And the most important element and factor in all this equation is missing. If you go to the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, it starts with that quote, we the people. If you go to democracy, you hear it is government of the people, by the people, for the people. And within the concept of the people is what you have as office of the citizen. As at today, it does not exist. It's a terrible vacuum where the elected officers, they are lords. We just go to, you know, uh, election time and, and go through the, the motions and then um, give them the mandate, so to speak, or, uh, or exchange the mandate because we really don't give them more than exchange. And boom, we sit down and wait for another four years. And during these four years, we are whining, we are complaining, and we are saying, no, there is need to come back and have the ownership structure put in place. When you are a tenant in somebody's house, and you do not know that in your agreement, the landlord can come and inspect the facility every six months. You can treat the house as you wish. But when you know that the landlord is there, he's passing, he's watching, and he cannot wait for six months to come and see, you will find, find more compulsion to keep that house in a good state. So we are now saying, let the civil society come alive again. In those days, it used to be labor, it used to be the student organizations, it used to be civil society. You know, that those three legs to start with, at a stage, farmers were a force to reckon with. But all these people constitute the office of the, of the citizen, which is what you call the civil society. Now, we need to reestablish that so that we can hold our public officers to account. Nobody's holding them to account, so they are running riots. Because I do not see how they are local companies. You know, we, you know where we started from? Value of the Naira. Mm. Please convert 40 billion equivalent to dollars to go and buy cars. Meanwhile, there's innocent next door. And I'm not hearing them talk about it as a state policy that we cannot patronize any external organization where there is a Nigerian option. It's a simple, you know, policy. We cannot patronize foreign goods where there is a Nigerian option. If that option is not good enough, let us manage it. And when we know that we are going to wear the suit from this tailor, now we will go help the tailor to become better because we want to look good. But when we know that if the suit is not good enough, I'll buy the one that is important. We just jettison and leave this the labor, this, this tailor. But for a reason of self-preservation, if we know that important suits are not there, we start to look for tailor. We'll even sit with tailor and say, ah, guy, look now, Abba, don't be you. Look at this lapel, how they look. Eh? Let it be square now, let it be the other. We will help the tailor to get better. So, my brother, it, it, um, it's a system where we, the citizens, must wake up and take responsibility. I'll end on this. That saying that, you know, the problem of Nigeria is leadership is a lie, is a fallacy, is a lie, absolute lie. The problem, because in democracy, the leadership is chosen. It's not the private, uh, the organized private sector where nobody knows how I make my money. In, 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 in democracy, Mr. President is chosen by us. We chose him. So if it is a bad president, because we gave ourselves a bad president, let us come back 
and know that the problem of Nigeria as of today is failure of taking responsibility by the office of the citizen. The moment we, the citizens, think right, people will even be afraid to even contest for certain offices because they know that they won't go anywhere. Because we, the citizens, would have done our due diligence and at the ballot, they say, hey, they're not going allow. Who not go allow? Who are those that cause problems? In this last election, please tell me the soldier that came and lined up and said, you cannot vote, you cannot vote. We voted freely. Hey, they induced us. Are you be mumu? And they induced you. You don't get mind to say, if they had told you, I'm sorry to say this on national television, but let me say it because it's important. If you have a girl that you want to marry next week, and somebody comes to you and says, I beg, but guy, things are hard with you. Give me this, your bed. Make him come give me one for two nights. I'll give you 100,000. You look at that man and say, God, please, please respect yourself. Are you OK? My own, my own fiancé. I ask a question, are things no longer hard? But somebody will give you 2,000 naira. He said, things are hard. You know, you go and give out your mandate. It's because you don't understand the power of the mandate you're giving out and that you're going to be complaining for the next four years. Does it make sense? So we need to start to occupy that office of the citizen, enlighten our people, take the right decision, elect the right leaders, and have our country working the way it should be. That, uh, that opens a really, really new chapter. Uh, when you talk about the office of the citizen, some people seem to know, some people seem to uh, choose not to know and all that. Who will lead this fight? Who will be at the fore when we're trying I to capture back? This fight. I will be at the fore for 20 years. I took on social housing. There was not a mention, there was not a word Today, social housing is a full chapter in the approved national housing policy. And Nigerians honor me with the title of Mr. Social Housing. Mm -hmm. Office of the citizen is another thing I've decided to take up. I will take it up. I will put my money. I spend millions in hundreds of my personal money to advance social housing. And that is what I'm going to do with social governance and office of the citizen. I will do it. And you know the good news? I'm not alone. Mm. There are so many people across Nigeria that feel the way that I do. Look at the answers. They are my people. Look at the obedient movement. The obedient movement is not about a man called Peter Obi. No. It's an ideology of people that say enough is enough. But you know, we make a mistake of thinking that the obedient movement is about a man. No, it's not about a man. He just fitted the cap and drove. Do you understand me? A time comes when he's going to exit and the ideology moves on. So they are there. Mm. So for me, it's a right time, and I will, by the grace of God, as God, as God gives me the strength and capacity, I will move it until my last breath is there. Mm. Okay. We are behind you. So whatever you need to do, we are behind you. Okay. We need to take Nigeria to that Eldorado we dream about. Uh, just to wrap it up, let's go to something that is worrisome. Uh, uh, when, when fuel went up, okay, that, I'm talking about petrol now, or PMS, when it went up, people began to look for alternatives. The alternatives have always been there, but people uh, did not take uh, them seriously. But now that it was on our neck, that we couldn't buy uh, petrol anymore, people went to the, the alternatives. One of these alternatives is using gas. And luckily, when fuel or petrol went up, gas was coming down. Now we just found this story on the punch that cooking gas prices will rise next week. That's what the marketers are saying. So I don't know what your comments are on that. That, that feels like a threat to me. You cannot cook, you cannot power your generator because now people are powering their generators, people are powering their cars with uh, gas. And we were applauding the government and the fact that, or on the fact that uh, gas was not going up, instead it was coming down. How does this look to you? Gas, we've been told by marketers, will go up next week. You know, we, we, we run a country where people take advantage of every and any situation. There may be reasons for, for there, there is reason for increasing the cost of anything. There is reason, you know, because if nothing else, I'm an employer of labor, and my staff are starting to say, sir, please, the transportation, the money, and it is true. 
you pay minimum wage of 30,000 naira, and that guy that used to use maybe uh, 5,000 to work is now using 15,000 naira to come to work. So instead of 20,000, uh, 25,000 being left for him, he now has less than 15,000 to feed and everything. So you have to increase his salary. So they should have known by today that gas will go up. So I would have expected that before now, and because like that back room has told Mr. President that as we are converting to gas, how do we keep gas down? And there are one, two, three things they would have done, you know, to make sure that the price of gas is left. And let me even tell you that I am one of those that converted. You know, the big generator, we kind of kept them aside. There are these little generators that can take three ACs. I've said this before, one for your bedroom, one for the parlor upstairs, and one for any other place that can be taken. I actually got one of my staff who told me, sir, the amount of money you are spending on petrol is not too much. Yo. I said, what else? He said, gas. You know, that uh, medium size, I think 25 kg, whatever, feels for about 8,000 naira. Meanwhile, I was spending over close to 20,000, no, no, about 15,000 naira, almost on a daily basis. On, on petrol, and there was no light throughout in my estate, you know, where I stay in Rio, shelter free, you know. So he actually got me the converter, which he says there are three types. There's this one for 25, there's this one for 75, the German or the Dutch product. Anyway, bottom line, he actually converted it and then took one of the gas cylinders, put it, and my generator started. And boy, I ran my generator throughout, and that 8,000 naira gas lasted me for about two days, as opposed to the 10,000 daily. You get the point. So it was like half the price. So I did convert to gas. You know, another thing that we've done in the rural areas is there's, there's this safe 80 atmosphere uh, cooking, you know, pot. You know, it uses 20% um, uh, of what you would have used before. Like in the rural areas, firewood or the petrol, the kerosene you would have used. This thing cooks very well and uses only 20%. That's why they call it Save 80, and it is globally rated as one of those, um, you know, climate change approved, um, you know, things, especially for rural areas, so that they can stop using firewood, number one. And number two, they can also have the health benefit of not inhaling, you know, um, the smokes and everything. So different things are coming up, you know? That converter is coming up to go to gas. This um, atmosphere safe 80 is coming up to save the lives of the people and uh, save 80% of your cooking, you know, um, um, cost. So many things are coming up. And um, let the federal government look for a way of intervening in all these areas, like this safe 80 stuff. How can they make sure that the factories in Nigeria, there's one in Kano, there's one coming up in Kefi, there's one proposed in Uyo. How they can, can they come up to, you know, kind of encourage these different um, alternatives so that before we reach there, we already have, you know, something that is safe 80, internationally rated and approved by the global climate change bodies. Such are the things that the federal government and the state government should be getting into. I'm happy to say that in Akwaibo State, the state government is looking into it. And uh, though we are still in the tribunal, but uh, we, are, we are working together to make sure that the people are the better for it. OK. Well, we'd like to thank you for your time this morning. It's been wonderful having you, as usual, uh, architect, coming on the show to share your thoughts. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and God bless you, sir. OK. We've been talking with architect Ezekiel Nyaito, a public affairs analyst that spoke with us from Uyo Akwaibom State. We'll take a break. When we return, we'll be uh, talking to another guest on our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>